On the 6th of November at 1 p.m. Japanese Standard Time, Kirigaya Kazuto finally had the opportunity to dive back into the world of Sword Online, the world's first full dive MMORPG, an advanced VR technology going beyond a mere screen in front of your eyes and allowing one to fully immerse themselves in a different world using the first generation full dive device, the Nerve Gear produced by Argus. In this world, he felt more alive than the real one. Here he was Kirito, the infamous last attack bonus stealer, the swordsman in black who made it all the way to the floor 10 boss room and managed to catch a glimpse of the serpent samurai back in the beta, Kagachi the samurai lord. At that point, little did he think about his friend from the beta test that he broke contact with after abandoning him to be beaten by bullies behind a convenience store as he appeared in the town of beginnings again. It was a fresh start and this time, with 100 floors to conquer, of the steel castle floating in the sky, Aincrad. Welcome everyone, it's me GamerTurk and this is the complete history of the Sword Online series. Not one of those low tier, I might just recite two sentences from an episode, but an extensive timeline with all the canon events as much as we know, not just things the anime decided to adapt, but due to the scope of the project, I will omit a lot of finer details here. For those final details, you may want to visit my SAO Explained series, where I fill the blanks of the anime comparing them to the episodes, or my Story of the Past series, where I deep dive into events with no stones unturned that were never adapted by the anime before. Also, for each event I am referencing in this video, you'll see certain labels indicating whether it was adapted faithfully, or if there were conflicts with the source material, or if it was not adapted at all. For the conflicting cases, I will mention whether the anime portrayal officially supersedes the source material, the Sword Online light novels by Reki Kawahara, or if the adaptation is non-canon, or an incomplete coverage of the events, and the pop-ups in the middle of the screen will give you a lot of context regarding all of it when they happen. I started writing this script in September 2022, thus the most recent releases currently are Sword Online Vol. 26 United Ring 5 and Sword Online Progressive Vol. 8. United Ring 6 will have come out by the time this video is up, but it will not be included in this edition of the timeline. If you stumbled upon this video sometime after the release, you should potentially look for an updated timeline video instead. I am not sure when I'm gonna do that because this has been way too long of a project. I will also link more detailed videos in the case of some events and hope to increase the library of those detailed event summaries in the future as well as part of my story of the past series. Links to all the respective light novels in English as well as fan translations will be in the description in the order of coverage. With that, we return to Aincrad once more. Upon leaving the town of beginnings with a rush, Kirito was quickly spotted by another seasoned gamer with red hair and his bandana, Klein. The charming man quickly came to the conclusion that Kirito was a former beta tester due to the confident moves and requested him to show him the ropes of the game. About over 4 hours of grinding the basics together and forming a bond, they suddenly noticed the lack of the logout button on their menu and were forced teleported back into the town of beginnings promptly after. In the starter teleport gate plaza, the creator of Sword Online, Kayaba Akiko, made his grand appearance in front of the almost 10,000 players to welcome them with a tutorial speech. That the lack of a logout button was not a bug. That death in Sword Online meant that the nerve gears would fry the brains of the players, effectively ending their life in the real world. That he had already announced the news to the world, with 213 people dying prematurely due to their close ones attempting to forcefully remove the nerve gear from their heads already. And of course, that the only way to get back to the real world was to clear the 100 floors of the steel castle Aincrad. Overriding the avatars of the players into their real world looks using self-calibration data and a high density scan of their heads, he left the scene with the words that most players would refuse to accept for a long time to come. This may be a game, but it's not something you play. As the shocked players started sounding up in terror, there were already a few who knew they had to make a move quickly. 
the former beta testers who knew the fields nearby would soon be overrun, instanced quests or quests with a cooldown timer clogged up, potential automated balancing systems altering spawns, and quest requirements with the rush of players. Kirito immediately grabbed Klein by his arm and rushed out to convince his new and only friend in this world to come along ahead of the curve. He had turned his back on the only friend he had in this world months ago and did not even have the face to ever wonder if he was here in Aincrad now after that event. But Klein's response only made it harder for him as the red-haired player told him he had friends waiting to meet back up in town and that he cannot leave them behind. Kirito could survive with another capable player by his side in more advanced areas, but he was petrified by the idea of having to shoulder the lives of half a dozen other players, leaving him unable to respond. Cementing his care, understanding and friendship, but also causing Kirito the pain of abandoning his only friend yet again, Klein threw lighthearted jabs at Kirito, urging him to move on and stay safe. They added each other as friends, but Kirito once again would not have the face of contacting yet another abandoned friend for a long time to come. In the next hour, Kirito rushed to the next town of Horunka, where there was a quest for a one-handed sword, the Enil Blade. For the quest, he needed to hunt the monsters called Little Nepenthes, of which there were three variants of. The one with a stalk on its head, the common variant found in abundance, the one with a poisonous fruit, a rare trap variant that called all nearby Nepenthes to group up on the unsuspecting player, and the rare flower variant, the one that would drop the required quest item. As he grinded for the flower Nepenthes, another like-minded beta tester stumbled upon him and offered to work together for the sake of safety, but also to take advantage of the spawn boost effect that would accumulate as you kill normal types that would make it easier for the flower head to spawn. They exchanged their names with the boy, Copper, and for a moment, Kirito felt like he may have come across him at some point as one of the thousand testers, but he was never careful about remembering names. However, he did fail to realize that the other player had reacted to his name in a peculiar way. The first in-game death happened as the duo unknowingly grinded for over an hour. A player called Arvin refused to believe the words of Kayaba Akiko and decided to put his own theory to the test. As his player avatar jumped off from the edge of Aincrad into the emptiness below, he was disconnected from the server and never seen again in Aincrad or in real life. Back in the forest of Horunka, Kirito and Koper encountered both a flower and a fruit Nepenthes. Koper kited the fruit away and stole it while Kirito dealt with the flower head, but Koper was watching Kirito from a distance very carefully. Kirito felt his breath get stuck when he saw Koper utter an apology in silence and activated the trap of the flower, hoping to hide in the nearby bush using his hiding skill proficiency. That was a monster PK, luring an unsuspecting player into a group of mobs to get them killed and obtain their items, including the quest item. Fortunately for Kirito, Koper did not know physically hiding did not help against monsters that did not rely on vision, so he was equally swamped by the surrounding mobs. Kirito was likely a higher level than Koper due to them never establishing an official party and XP yields favored the damage dealer in such cases. Kirito barely managed to survive his part of the divided onslaught, whereas Koper perished. Mockingly, Kirito made a grave for Koper using his remaining equipment and an additional quest item he found but did not need, unaware that he would regret this moment years later. He obtained the Anil Blade by giving the old lady the medicine ingredient for her sick daughter, but also noticed a change from the beta. The door in the backside was open, so he followed the lady, only to face the gratitude of a little kid, reminding him of his sister in the real world. All he remembered from the night was crying on the bed of the girl, finally facing the reality that he was not going back to see his adoptive family again. Kirito woke up early next morning, not getting much sleep, in his own rented in-room to the knocking of another player introducing herself as Argo, aspiring to be an info broker with iconic whiskers painted on her face. Hinting herself to be a beta tester but never actually confirming it, she quickly realized she was talking to the infamous swordsman in black, to the only beta tester that opened the door to the floor 10 boss room to catch a glimpse of the boss's name, Kagachi the Samurai Lord. 
The reason she was there was that Argo was suspecting Kayaba would not just allow beta tester to steamroll the first 10 floors with their knowledge and was certain that there would be changes here and there to get unsuspecting players killed. She collected information from Kirito regarding the Nepenthes quest, which was now apparently on a 24 hour cooldown, further stressing the importance of being the first to important quests and also embarked on another quest with them to collect more information. They likely could have saved themselves a massive moment of panic if they had realized the change in the name of the quest to begin with, but Argo still noted the changes in the Lost Calf quest, which was now titled Revenge of the Cow, with a much more active battle involvement of said cow to save the players in the nick of time and left Kirito the quest reward. It was a jar of cream that Argo told him to cheer someone up with it if he were to come across someone feeling down and went on her way to create her guidebook for the sake of the newbies in SAO. Throughout the upcoming weeks, Kirito became one of her most valuable friends as well as a very trusty business partner. The rest of November 2022 continued relatively eventless. Unlike the short disconnection allowed before the Nerve Gear killed its users, the players were given an extended disconnection timer during the early weeks of SAO as Kayaba implemented a grace period for the authorities to transport players into hospitals for medical care. During this time, the Japanese government also created the SAO Incident Victims Rescue Force and a man named Kikoka Sejiro was tasked as its leader per his own request, a man with a lot to hide behind his calm and casual nature. With almost a month passing and 2000 people dying since the SEO launch, November came to a close with the girl called Asuna getting tired of crying and nightmares she was having in the safety of an inn in the town of Beginnings and ventured into the floor one labyrinth, not to ensure her survival and clearing the game, but as her choice of how to die. A death nobody would know, as the final rapier she brought with her would shatter and she would be given freedom from the steel castle with a cobalt puncturing her virtual body consisting of data. Passing through numerous players including a mace user who lost her hope, she entered the floor one labyrinth and fought the cobalt mobs for days, only resting on the cold stone benches of a nearby safety zone. However, her envisioned heroic death would not come. 4 am on December 2nd, a swordsman in black came across the red hooded fencer deep in the labyrinth tower. The fencer rejected the warnings about mental exhaustion, not realizing it would snuff out her projected heroism in a second as she lost consciousness and toppled on the floor. Her name was Asuna Yuki. Her meticulously planned life had shattered in an instant when Asuna logged into Soart Online on November 6, 2022. A diligent student pressured by her mother to get top grades to fight for her place in a vicious world. Daughter of Yuki Shozo, the head of a technology company called Rekt, Asuna was born into a highly competitive and political world. Her brother Koichiro was already working at Rekt with her father. He was eager to play SAO on launch day but had to go on a business trip. Asuna, who never had much of a time to relax and discover different worlds outside of reading, was curious about the excitement her brother had. In a moment of weakness, she wanted to see it. To throw herself into a different world even for a moment. That moment, that moment was now an eternity for her, with no escape. Kayaba Kiko had proclaimed that the players were to clear all 100 floors of Aincrad or die in this world and the real one. With almost a month gone without even the first floor cleared, Asuna had made her choice on how to leave this world. Her future was already lost, so what was the point? When she woke up hours later in a green lush forest, with the swordsman in black guarding the premises hugging his scabbard just in case, all she could utter was her words of defeat. You shouldn't have bothered. As if it was sheer luck that he came across her, the swordsman chose his words very carefully upon recognizing the intent of the fencer. You're doing all of this for the purpose of beating the game, right? Not just to die in a dungeon. A meeting would take place in the final town of Floor 1, Tolbana. The floor boss room inside the labyrinth had been found and players would assemble to take down Ilfang the Cobalt Lord. While the fencer at least changed her mind to die for a purpose rather than throwing it away in the dungeon, 
This led to a long and awkward walk back to Tolbana. Kirito was not walking together with the fencer, but they were heading the same way, so Kirito was practically leading the way for her a couple meters ahead with an awkward distance. Just after separating, Argo popped up beside Kirito, making a remark about the girl implying she knew her from the first weeks. But that was not the topic of their meeting today. She told him someone had a purchase offer for his anneal blade for an unreasonably huge sum, which Kirito refused and found very suspicious, because his sword… It, it certainly was not worth that much. Before the first boss strategy meeting, he came across Asuna in an alleyway, offering her the cream to cheer her up as Argo had suggested over three weeks ago, giving the girl her first sense of realism in this digital world. Kirito wondered why she even fought with such dedication and unbeknownst to him, her reason was starting to change as she too was curious what made the boy in front of him fight on, despite the hopeless situation. When she said she was now fighting to not let this game beat her, Kirito uttered an apology about how he was one of the people who rushed on, leaving others behind to prioritize his own survival that the fencer could not hear properly. Did she really want to know the meaning of regret on his face? Forty-four players had gathered in Tolbana for the first strategy meeting, which was overshadowed by the demands of apology and reparations from the beta testers by a spiky-haired player called Kibao, who was promptly shut down by another player called Egil, stating that the beta testers had gone above and beyond to provide a guide that all players, but the beta testers who helped create and finance it for Argo, could obtain for free. There was even a warning about the beta information not always being accurate in the final release and that unconfirmed info from the test should be taken with a pinch of salt. Kirito still could not lift his head from shame after Kibao's words, but he was also suspecting the motive behind such an act. There was no way to tell if someone was a beta tester in the game and all this proclamation did was an attempt to sow seeds of mistrust among the clearers as if someone did not want the game to be cleared at all. Seeing the pain and confusion in Kirito's face, Asuna made a deal with him. If they both were to survive the boss raid ahead, he would tell her everything, how he left everyone behind for the sake of keeping himself alive. The following morning, on December 3rd, the boss room was found and the second and main strategy meeting was held. Partying together due to not having other friends, Kirito realized Asuna was lacking a lot of simple gaming information, so he suggested it would be a good idea to head to a farmhouse he was staying at. While Asuna was against the idea of running to the house of someone she just met, she did not need much persuasion after hearing about the large bath the farmhouse had. While Asuna was busy thinking about what was truly real, with her perspective on this digital world rapidly changing, just outside of the bathroom, which could not be locked, Kirito was having a hard time keeping his cool. At least this was a game and no bath effects like sound or moisture was going through the door. Meanwhile, Argo arrived at the house with a higher offer to purchase the anneal blade, at which point Kirito just paid the anonymity fee to learn about the buyer's identity, which turned out to be Kibao. He certainly did not need Kirito's sword, so Kirito was still hung up on the potential motive of the spiky-haired guy. But while he was thinking, he heard Argo turning a doorknob of none other than the bathroom. The shrieking sounds and a player that was not Argo rushing out of the bathroom was the last thing Kirito remembered of that night. On December 4, the journey to the boss room started tense, not only because of the events of the previous night, but also because Kibao's lovely mug, spiky hair and exaggerated accent was Kirito's first experience of the walk, reminding him that he had no business around the boss and should take care of the ads instead. No matter how much he tried, he couldn't find the reason why Kibao of all people would need to try purchasing his sword. After a heartwarming talk about fantasy worlds between Kirito and Asuna, Kirito made sure to motivate Asuna to do her best in the boss fight by telling her there are much grander baths on the floors to come. At 12.40, the clearers went through their final checks and the doors to the first floor boss room opened, 
with Ilfang the Cobalt Lord officially challenged. Asuna was astounded by the fighting prowess of the Swordsman in Black. Just days ago in the dungeon, she had shrugged off his tips completely, never having seen him in battle, never having the intention to. But in fight, she fully understood what he meant by overkill. The boy was meticulously planning his attacks, only using sword skills when he absolutely needed to, utilizing basic attacks when they sufficed. After another set of enemies that they successfully dispatched, the boy threw a GJ her way, which is much better written than pronounced. Not knowing what the abbreviation stood for, Asuna returned the favor with a simple U2. They rushed onto the next bunch, with Asuna feeling the intensity of true battle in this world, holding her new wind flurry the boy gave her the previous day, with the first health bar of Ilfang emptying out. As the battle progressed, Kirtan and Asuna were dispatching the enemies faster than some other support groups with 6 member parties, including Kibaos, but since that would only make their job easier, Kirtan was surprised to hear Kibao snap back at him regardless taunting him as to how his plan must have backfired completely. How he would not be able to use the dirty tricks he used back in the beta to steal the last attack bonuses. That one, it, it was a much sharper realization than the fear he had during the first day. Not only did Kibao know for a certain he was a beta tester, but also knew what he was famous for in the beta. But he mentioned he had heard it from someone, so he was merely projecting someone else's attitude onto him. He was a proxy for someone else. Kirito asked that directly to him, but Kibao claimed the people purchased the info from Argo. Kirito knew that one was a lie. That was Argo's red line, especially with the way SAO is now. Everything had a price for the rat, but not identifying beta testers. Someone who knew Kirito from the beta had specifically targeted him to put him in the back lines on top of attempting to lower his battle potential by trying to purchase away his prized sword. It could have been only one person in the room. Ilfang roared loudly with reaching his final health bar and thus changing his weapon as stated in the guide. Kirito was lost in thought and it took him an additional moment to realize something was different with Ilfang the Kobold Lord's new animation. And he had only realized it when his suspect started rushing towards the enemy, too much in tunnel vision to notice the change himself. Kirito yelled for everyone to step back but it was too late. Floor 10 was the highest floor the beta testers had reached with katana wielding serpent type monsters. And those monsters? There was one nasty skill they possessed, only when surrounded by multiple players that they initiated. Ilfang, surrounded by 6 other players, initiated that skill, a wide area stun attack for katana type weapons, Tsumuji Guruma. Diawel the Knight, the one who led the boss meeting, the one who put Kirito in the back lines, was lying smack on the ground. Kirito tried to warn about the follow-up attack, but Agil was too late to step in and Diawel's clumsy flail was not recognized as a sword skill to counter the blow, resulting in him taking the hit head-on, getting smashed to the back of the room close to Kirito. The two locked their eyes and at that moment, Kirito realized he knew the player. He didn't recognize him, but they had surely met under different appearances back in the beta. He recognized Kirito though, knew how he played in the beta and specifically aimed to lower his chances of pulling the same tricks. His beta knowledge had poisoned him and led to his death. Kirito saw his lips move from slightly far away, urging him to take the lead and kill Ilfang, and shattering into polygons promptly after before Kirito could even lift a finger. At that moment, there was hate in Kibao's eyes, absolute hate and rage. But Kirito remained unfazed, urged everyone to not waste a single moment. If they stalled even for a bit, more Cobalt Sentinels would rush the field and sweep the floor with them. Asuna stood by him, proclaiming she would fight as his partner. 
grabbing her cape and throwing it up into the air, Asuna grabbed everyone's attention, which Kirito used to quickly instruct players about the katana attack patterns. For about 20 quick rotations that came after, Kirito and Asuna successfully managed to dodge, parry and chip away at the boss's health bar as the rest of the squads regrouped, healed and tried to get over the shock, but their luck had run out as Kirito failed to react quickly enough to one of Ilfang's skill, throwing him away. But finally, it was another team who came to their rescue. Keeping their distance from the boss as a group to not proc the area attack, it was Agil's team. With Agil's tanky squad taking the front line following Kirito's guidance as he and Asuna healed up, the fight continued intensely with others keeping the mobs away. With a final switch, Kirito obtained the last attack bonus on Ilfang the Cobalt Lord by the skin of his teeth. The first floor was now cleared, but the problems the problems were just beginning. Egil wholeheartedly celebrated Kirito and Asuna for their heroic efforts that pretty much saved everyone in the room, but not everyone was as understanding. One of Dieval's friends, the player named Lind, snapped back at Kirito for not warning them earlier for letting Dieval die, along with others crying behind him. Kibao, Kibao was surprisingly not talking or accusing Kirito as if he had realized something and was struck by indecision. He wasn't blaming Kirito for this. It was as if he was suspicious that he was purposefully led to hate this person who had just saved them all. But someone else from his team with a screeching voice stepped forward to pull through with his agenda, accusing Kirito of being a beta tester publicly and accusing Argo of purposefully misleading players with false info in her guidebook. Kibao remained silent still. The scheme he unknowingly became part of just had the full wind in its sails. Kirito recognized the need to focus the hate on himself and started speaking in a tone Asuna never heard him talk before, separating himself from the beta testers and taking the title of beater, effectively foiling the plans of hate against the beta testers as a whole. Kirito snapped back that they should not follow him unless they were prepared to die and moved on to the second floor. But there was one person to follow. A couple minutes after Kirito had reached the second floor, Asuna had opened the door as well. Both Agil and Kibao had encouraging messages for him, with Kibao choosing to express them in his own unique manner. Teaching the basics of the UI to Asuna, there was one last message for him, this time straight from her. She thanked him for giving her a goal that she wants to reach, but she refused to elaborate any further. And when Kirito wanted to fulfill his part of the promise to tell her why he blamed himself for the state of SAO, Asuna cut her off by telling it wasn't necessary, saying that she understood enough. They separated after looking at the beautiful scenery and Asuna went back down to floor 1 while Kirito continued to the main town of floor 2, Urbus. He saw a message pop up on his UI an apology from Argo due to everyone glossing over the warning in the guidebook that resulted in Kirito having to shoulder all the hate, and to make up for it, she offered any one piece of information on the house completely free of charge. So Kirito responded, why the whiskers? It didn't take too long after that to activate the teleport gate to floor 2 and then later that day find Argo being chased by some ninja themed players trying to obtain information about the martial arts skill that she refused to sell. Kirito quickly managed to save her from the two ninja, not really through his terrible joke annoying them, but rather a mob starting to chase them down causing them to retreat. Argo brought him to an NPC that was supposed to give him the extra skill, martial arts as a quest reward if he was able to break a large boulder in two without the use of his weapons. Kirito wanted answers about the whiskers and he had gotten it. The NPC marked his face with them with a dye that cannot be washed off until breaking the boulder. Argo was not going to clear it of course, she wanted the authentic whiskers that she did not need to dye on as a makeup, but it took Kirito three days to break the boulder. On December 7th, he obtained a martial arts skill, and he finally returned to town. On December 8th, the town bellowed with the cries of a player who failed to be blessed by RNG to enhance his weapon at a player shop owned by a player called Neza. 
Player blacksmiths should theoretically offer better rates, but you could technically just be forsaken by RNG gods to be that unfortunate. It was a very low chance, but all enhancement attempts had the potential to fail and drop your weapon by one enhancement level. Starting with a plus 4 weapon, the client had somehow angered enough gods to hit that 4 times back to back, yielding a plus 0 weapon back at him. It truly felt surreal. Asuna suddenly appeared behind Kirito who called her up on the situation and it surely was impossibly unfortunate. Scared by what they just saw transpire, the duo decided to grind materials to maximize the success rate of their enhancement attempts, parting up again after 4 entire days. They had a little race to kill the most enemies during their session and Kirito barely lost and thus paid for a luck increasing cake for himself and Asuna before going off to enhance their weapons. Asuna's Wind Flurry plus 4 was first in line, with enough materials to boost the chance up to a whopping 95% success rate. But that didn't matter. The boy named Neza looked absolutely terrified and stumbled before accepting the request for the upgrade. The Wind Flurry flashed for a moment during the upgrade and then… then it crumbled into nothingness. The sword that was given to Asuna by Kirito that kept her anchored in this virtual world was gone. But that was not even a possibility, a weapon, a weapon would not just crumble in an upgrade attempt. The most that could happen was being downgraded a level on a failure. Asuna couldn't even speak and Kirito demanded an explanation for something that was not even supposed to be on the table, going as far as bringing up his beta tester status to push Neza further into a corner, but there was no answer. They must have put a new ultra rare failure state, probably. They left the square with Neza's heartfelt apologies and refused any reparations for the unfortunate event. Kirito tried to lift Asuna's mood, but Wind Flurry had been a partner for her. Part of an attachment she never fully told Kirito back when they first arrived on floor 2. That newfound purpose she had, that was a complete opposite than just 7 days ago, where she fought to die with expendable iron rapiers. She wanted to keep the sword by her side as long as possible. Kirito tried to provide some levity that it can be done by melting a sword into an ingot and crafting a new one from that as if transforming the soul of a weapon into a new form. And on that line, Kirito promised to help Asuna buy a new sword the next day and walked her to her inn for that day. Kirito activated his hiding skill when he arrived back in the plaza that afternoon alone. Something was definitely wrong and he was determined to find out. He watched Neza's shop for a while and eventually followed him to an inn where he met with his friends. While the bunch was extremely thrilled, Neza had an aura full of regret. He said he no longer wanted to do the job. There was a trick, but what it was, Kirito just couldn't figure out. Until he recognized the flash of the wind flurry before the upgrade. It dawned on him. There were only minutes left when he started to rush towards Asuna's room and open the locked door, thanks to having an active party still, leading Asuna to scream in surprise at this person rushing into her room. Trying to calm her down, Kirito instructed her to activate a special materialize all items prompt which led to all her items in her inventory and ownership to be materialized into the room and under all that pile, there it was, Wind Flurry plus 4. Asuna was absolutely furious with all her underwear being scattered across the room with Kirito around no less. But Kirito quickly explained he had solved the trick, partially at least, to steal her wind flurry and replace it in a literal flash with a stock wind flurry that somehow ended up crumbling visibly. But it was not a stealing ability. Asuna's wind flurry was given by hand, so it did not count as a stealing action. Thus, it would take some time before the ownership rights would be overwritten. And if Kirito was just minutes late in prompting Asuna to materialize all the items she owned, her Wind Flurry plus 4 would officially be lost to the scam attempt. The duo spent the next day watching the two sides of the clearing squad, two people that came up as leaders with different ambitions in the void left by DOL, Lind and Kibao squads, take down a field boss, Bulbus Bao, with the help of some additional members that did not belong to either side. Surprisingly high tier equipment, 
with seemingly awkward actions at times as if lacking experience. The currently unofficial guild, Legend Braves, consists of Neza's friends he saw at the inn last night. The duo exchanged some ideas with Argo after realizing that despite being discovered, as Nessa would have realized the missing Windflurry plus 4 that now had returned to Asuna, the legend Braves did not stop pulling their scam and were now situated at a town close to the labyrinth in preparation for the upcoming boss raid of floor 2. Luckily, Argo brought up the missing piece to the scam before they would confront Nessa about it. The only way a weapon would crumble is when you try to enhance it when it had already run out of enhancement attempts, meaning Neza had quick changed Asuna's Wind Flurry plus 4 into a worthless Wind Flurry that was all out of upgrade slots. Watching him do the same trick to an unfortunate clear called Shivata and confirming their suspicions, and of course experimenting a bit themselves to make sure it was indeed possible, they decided to confront Neza. As they went for a fake upgrade attempt that they were sure Nessa would steal the sword of, it was time for Nessa to apologize as part of their scam. But Kirito cut him off and rematerialized his anneal blade after its supposed destruction, all to Nessa's shock, and confronted him with the entire explanation about how he was pulling off the trick using a skill known as Quick Change, immediately swapping the weapon with a second replica of it with the hit of a button under all the blacksmithing effects. With the definitive proof shoved at his face, Neza came clean and explained to Kirito about his full dive nonconformity, or FNC for short. In rare circumstances, the nerve gear could be incompatible with the user due to, well, the human brain actually being a very complicated thing. In some severe cases, it can lead to a user not even being able to full dive at all, or sometimes it can come forth during moments of panic or heightened emotions, adding complexity to the data, rendering the device confused in a sense. But some incompatibilities that were not considered severe would be allowed to dive with its handicaps and in SAO, all those handicaps were quite deadly. In the virtual world, Neza was left without any depth perception, making him nigh useless in a game built around close quarters combat. Kirito made a deal with Neza, having recognized the pain and regret since the first time he saw the guy. He would not expose them to the clearers, which could even result in executions due to the high tensions, and they would never use the scam again that they had learned from a mysterious man in a poncho one day. Neza would drop the blacksmithing skill and his guild legend braves would participate to clear the game through legitimate means. As an added bonus, he shared information about an extra skill, a way to use the throwable weapons called chakrams. Three days later on December 14, the boss fight went relatively smoothly with Kibao putting his trust in Kirito's instincts. At least, the part that was in the beta. It was a double boss rush with a lot of paralysis effects back in the beta, you first needed to defeat Nato the Colonel Taurus and then Baran the General Taurus. But when Baran reached yellow HP, a new presence appeared in the middle of the arena, the true boss of floor 2 that was not present in the beta, Asterios the Taurus King. If there was any reason to retreat, this was absolutely it, but in unexpected circumstances, an impromptu retreat attempt was more dangerous than fighting on. Asterios also had a nasty wide-range lightning breath attack that only piled on the paralysis effects. It would have been truly over if it wasn't Neza arriving at the last second and hitting Asterios in its weak spot, the crown on the top of its head. During this time, Argo had done some additional quests back in town to learn more about the lore of the floor and figured out the additional boss that would appear and finding Neza along the way had brought him with her to the rescue of everyone. The party took care of Asterios relatively easily, with Kirtan Asna managing an almost impossible leap to the crown, the Taurus King burst into flames. And what followed, Agil's familiar congratulations, was a heartfelt apology by the legend Braves, coming clean themselves to everyone with deep regret. Despite the best efforts of a screeching member, the apology was eventually accepted rather than an execution. According to Kirito, Floor 3 was where SAO truly began. This was because the main town of Zumfut and the surrounding Forest of the Wavering Mists 
held the first multi-floor main campaign of the game, the Elf War Quest, where players pledged allegiance to either the Dark Elves or the Forest Elves factions, which would culminate in an epic ending on floor 9. Kirto took Asuna to a secluded spot where a Dark Elf and a Forest Elf was fighting, and they decided to fight alongside a Dark Elf named Kizmel. It was supposed to be a scripted event that lasted about 3 minutes where their chosen party would sacrifice themselves to save the participants and send them off to their quest in their final moments. To Kirto's surprise, who had urged Asuna to prioritize self-defense and let the event play out, the opposing forest elf collapsed on the ground after 20 minutes without ever getting a chance to trigger his dark elven counterpart's final sacrifice. After achieving the impossible, Kirto thought it was his imagination that their alive companion Kizmel was standing there in confusion, making Kirto fear that they may have just broken the quest. It took until Kirto reacted upon a dropped item for Kizmel to gather bearings and start functioning again as if the quest was being adapted into the unforeseen circumstances. She thanked the humans who came to their rescue and guided them to the nearby Dark Elf camp. The Elf War campaign also functioned as the main quest of most of the floors until floor 9 as well, so clearing the quest did provide a lot of valuable information regarding the floor boss and the floor in general. With Kizmel becoming their personal assistant throughout the quest had also given a massive advantage to Kirtan Asna, as Kizmel seemed to be quite the high level NPC, as expected of a participant of a scripted event that was not supposed to have been won. This allowed Kirtan and Asuna to clear quests and make progress much faster than usual. While Asuna approached Kizmel like a normal person rather than an NPC, Kirto was perplexed by her extensive background and seemingly high level of adaptability as a quest NPC was not supposed to be this interactive and only possessed the capabilities to respond to basic requests that it was programmed to do. It was almost as if the system designated Kizmel as a special AI that was tasked with adapting to a now broken quest chain and basically make it work whatever unexpected diversion is thrown her way. The next day, as Kirta suggested during the weapon upgrade scam in the previous days, Asna melted her wind fleuret into ingots and created a new weapon, the Shivalic Rapier, from it to preserve the soul of her weapon. The duo later had to go through an uncomfortable boss meeting run by Lind, the leader of the Dragon Knights Brigade, and Kibao, the leader of the Aingrad Liberation Squad, with the two of them sprawling off into the two camps after Dieval's death. They requested if Kirtan Asuna were to ever join a guild, they would have to pick one and separate as it was of utmost importance that both guilds remained on a power balance to keep each other in check. Kirta and Asuna refused joining the guilds, while Kirta also decided to be a bit more perceptive on the players involved on both sides and how they behave towards them to start keeping track of top players who may be helpful and those who seem like trouble. He figured things would only get more tense from here onwards. This request got to Asuna's nerves as to how they were treating her and Kirto like tools, but Kirto calmed her down and was surprised by Kizmel praising Kirto on keeping his calm as she had arrived in town and was observing the events transpire. Continuing the L4 quest for a while with her, Kirto woke up at night to proceed with the next quest step in secret on his own due to it being a stealth activity, but before starting the infiltration mission he noticed someone watching him from afar. A player called Morte, who he saw among Kibao's groups at the meeting in his full chainmail armor. He was waiting there to sound the alarm for the forest elf camp to ambush Kirto and Asuna, however the guy claimed he was there to ensure their group would do the quest first as it was instanced and offered Kirto a duel, the winner of which would continue normally. Not suspecting the offer at all, Kirto agreed to a first hit duel where the first player to reach yellow HP would be considered the loser. As the duel continued with increasing intensity however and PvP trickery on the side of Morte, Kirto was almost killed as Morte was trying to legitimately kill Kirto by getting him just above the yellow and then landing a massive fatal blow as a critical hit, which would also make sure his cursor would remain green because it was an official duel. 
It was the first time Kirito encountered such a sneaky attempt to PK someone since his experience back in the first day. Kirito relented for long enough and upon hearing a nearby sound, Morta announced the duel was a draw and retreated. Kirito soon heard the yells from a nearby clearing as well, with DKB and ALS almost at each other's throats for who would do their instant quest first. Kirito absolutely knew he was not in a position to calm their nerves and that someone was trying to incite trouble between the two guilds, so while they argued, he didn't interfere and infiltrated the castle to clear the quest instead, which caused the camp to vanish and appear somewhere else on the floor once completed. When he returned and proclaimed he had cleared the quest, naturally, another argument broke out. Morta was nowhere to be seen, but the player called Joy tried throwing accusations at Kirito in hopes of heating things up again, but with Asuna's arrival alongside Kizmel, who appeared as a ultra high NPC allied with Kirito and Asuna, both sides settled down as they did not want to fight. With tensions down, it was agreed on both sides as well as by Kirito that Kirito and Asuna would continue the L4 campaign as an official part of the clearing efforts and both guilds would drop the campaign altogether to prevent such an escalation from ever happening again as everyone agreed such a deal was in the best interests of clearing the game despite the continued attempts of certain players to cause trouble. With the L4 quest of floor 3 complete, Kirito and Asuna were informed about the poison capabilities of the floor boss which they relayed to DKB and ALS. On December 21st, floor 3 boss Nereus the Evil Trant was defeated. In the next hour, floor 4 was unlocked for all players as Kirito and Asuna managed to reach the main town of the floor, Rovia, through an unexpected and massive change to the floor. The full desert and canyon floor of the SAO beta was now a water-based floor filled with waterways reminiscent of the Italian town of Venice. Going through a lengthy quest and defeating a field boss called Magnetherium, the duo crafted their own gondola named after Kismel's sister-in-law, Tilnel, and thus easily could continue their floor progress without having to rely on paid gondola services. Kirito and Asuna simply continued the L4 campaign on floor 4, which mainly acted as the introduction to a third faction of the elves called the Fallen Elves, basically trying to foil the plans of whichever of the two factions you sided with in the previous floor, that being collecting multiple jade keys to restore the world before Aincrad. And aside from that, floor 4 did not really feature a lot of standout moments throughout its runtime. With Kirito and Asuna unlocking the floor on December 21st, followed by a field boss called Biceps Archelon being defeated in a large naval battle on December 24, the duo completed the L4 quest of the floor by repelling a massive forest elf invasion in the dark elf castle of the floor, convincing the main NPC of the castle, Viscount Yophilis, to take part in the battle to turn the tides. On December 27, the floor boss White Edge the Hippocampus was defeated, with both Kizmel and Viscount Yophilis dominating the battle as supporting NPCs, despite the terrible time the clearers had before them joining alongside Kirito, Asuna and Argo due to the flooding trap of the water horsey. And while floor 4 went by with a lot of bonding time between Kirito, Asuna and Kizmel, it was an awfully quiet week for the scheming group of disruptors, the screechy band of PK players. The following day of the floor 5 opening, on December 28, Kirito decided it is time to get Asuna familiar with PvP duels, fearing that the PK band was prepping for something big. However, Asuna called off their practice duel attempt upon seeing the serious fighting intent on Kirito's face. For now, they pulled off their duel and continued their journey. Karluin was a floor of treasure hunting in the dungeons and catacombs, but unlike the lower and higher floors, it did not feature a significant L4 quest chase. However, towards the night, Kirito got worried that Argo was seemingly at a location unreachable via messages. He ensured Asuna that Argo would be fine, but that wouldn't prevent Asuna from realizing Kirito actually snuck out shortly after to go search for Argo because he was actually concerned for her safety, and Asuna decided to follow him until she lost track and stumbled upon a trap in the catacombs that dropped her to the lower levels. On top of her fear of ghosts, which there were plenty in the catacombs, Asuna was thrown into an absolute nightmare. Not only was her chivalric rapier stolen by a nearby sly shrewman, she had also stumbled upon a secret meeting between two of the PK gang members. The two horrors then intertwined 
when Morta and his partner stumbled upon the Sly Shrewman and obtained Asna's chivalric rapier instead. Just when she was ready to make a desperate move and take on the two PKers with a spare rapier she had, Kirito suddenly confronted the two instead, asking where they found the chivalric rapier. As the dialogue between Morta and Kirito continued to escalate into a duel, Asuna used her ingenuity to lure a nearby Sly Shrewman mob with a discarded item and launched a skill in their direction, causing them to fumble and drop the chivalric rapier into the hands of the Shrewman, which Asuna dispatched promptly to receive her trusty weapon back. With the sound attracting more mobs, Kirito grabbed Asuna and activated his hiding skill in a corner and the PK duo ran away, not engaging Kirito and Asuna who had just learned their new nasty plan to cause a rift between the two spearhead guilds. With the instigation of the secret PK gang members among his crowd, Kibao's guild was aiming to clear the floor 5 boss and grab the guild flag that drops as a reward to boost their power and tip the scale in their favor. Contacting some trustworthy members from both the Kibao's ALS and Lin's DKB, Kirito and Asuna aimed to build a team reliable enough to take on the floor 5 boss themselves. Liten and Okotan from the ALS, Shivata and Hafner from the DKB were joined by Egil and his bro squad as the neutral party, as well as Argo and Neza lending their strength to the duo. The ragtag group of players challenged the floor 5 boss Fuscus the Vacant Colossus on December 31st. After a tense and grueling 4 hours and 15 minutes, they managed to emerge triumphant from the boss room shortly before Kibao's team made it to the room shocked to see Kirito in possession of the Flag of Valor. In front of an angry and defeated Kibao, Kirito proposed his conditions to hand him the Flag of Valor, which he would later relay to Lind as well. Kirito would hand over the flag if there was a similar item drop in a future raid, in which case each guild would receive one flag, or if the two main guilds merge into one. When they were back at the New Year's party just hours later and they celebrated the New Year together, Kirito decided to go downstairs in the castle to grab some more supplies, but he was met with a knife that he barely dodged that came from the shadows. He had barely managed to dodge it, but he fell to the clutches of a mysterious man in a poncho who had a knife put to his back. He declared that it was showtime. Despite the mind tricks of the mysterious man, Kirito was absolutely certain the floor he was on right now did not count as part of the dungeon but rather the safe zone of the town above. With all of his strength he slammed himself back causing a purple light to come up, the system protection preventing the knife from actually stabbing him. With his initial plan to trick Kirito into moving him to a non-safe zone failed, the man in the poncho swiftly ran away. Kirito rushed back upstairs to find Asuna safe and hugged her lengthily. The new year had started with absolute horror, followed by relief. And what came next was a shower of purple effects following a punch in the gut for the unexpected intimate moment. Around 3am in the morning, the duo left the new year's party and arrived on floor 6 with the main town of Station where the theme was puzzles and settled in their rooms and had their well deserved rest. Upon waking up they met with Lin to talk about the conditions of giving up the flag of valor and continued on with the main quest of floor 6 which is not the L4 campaign but rather the curse of Station quest. At one point in the quest chain, the players were supposed to be paralyzed and captured by Lord Cylon, who was hiding a nasty secret that the players were supposed to bring to light over time. However, during the process of transporting the paralyzed Kirito and Asuna, suddenly their carriage came to a halt and Lord Cylon was killed by the attacking players, Morte and Joy. Before becoming the next target of the PKR duo, Kirito and Asuna used their ingenuity to create a smoke screen using the dropped items of Cylon to gain a little bit more time so that their paralysis status finally wore away. The moment it did, Kirito went on the offensive against Morta and discovered that he was no longer using his weapon and buckler for some reason, his offhand was empty and he suspiciously was using no sword skills at all. That gave enough of a hint to Kirito that there was something in Morte's offhand that caused him to be in irregular equipment status, preventing him from using any sword skills, which later turned out to be a high level poisonous throwing needle that should not even exist yet. While Asuna handled Joy quite proficiently by playing clever, Kirito almost murdered Morte in anger and shock, who had been in charge of attacking Cylon and them and had now turned orange along with his partner. 
Snapping out from it, Morta pulled Kirtos' sword of even tied out and ran away with joy in fear. With their orange cursors, the sign of a criminal player, they likely would not be able to tend to their secret guild duties in ALS and DKB until they cleared it. But the poison needles they had in their possession was a massive trouble for future encounters. With Cylon, a key quest NPC dead, it was unclear how the Curse of Station quest should proceed, but Kirito hoped they could just jumpstart the quest somewhere midway using his beta knowledge of it and effectively getting ahead of the quest story. In the meanwhile, the duo decided to head to Castle Galley to continue the L4 campaign and reunite with Kizmel. That night, while visiting one of the secret chambers in the Castle Galley, Kirito befriended an old and wise NPC called Barum and obtained the meditation skill with the Awakening mod at a high proficiency. However, it had not taken long until everything got very very tangled as quests and participants more and more started getting intertwined. Kizmel identified the poison needles as those used by the fallen elves, which meant the PK gang had found a way to initiate the third branch of the L4 campaign via the Fallen. Meanwhile, unlike the previous elf castles, Castle Galley was a public, non-safe zone instance, so other players who were doing the dark elf side of the story could also enter. Kirtan Asana already met another group calling themselves Kusak, who of course did not have an elite escort like Kizmel, but a regular guard accompanying them. While working together on collecting the key on floor 6 with Kizmel, she also agreed to assist them throughout the off the rails Curse of Station questline and our heroes came across a little girl NPC Maya searching for her mother effectively continuing the quest. However, everything came crumbling down when Castle Galley that was at least supposed to keep enemy designated players and NPCs at bay was suddenly attacked by the fallen elves. While Kirto, Asuna and Kizmel spent the day continuing the curse of Station, members of Kusak were captured by the PK gang and the leader of Kusak was forced into sabotaging the castle and its life source. Kirito managed to prevent it and together with the elves the attack was deflected, however now they had to save the other members of Kusak from the PK gang and the captivity of the fallen elves. Using the key items from the L4 campaign as bait, they managed to save Kusak members but in the process, the fallen elves ended up stealing the key items and used them to supposedly destroy Aincrad instead of the supposed promise of restoring Aincrad to an age before the floating castle as the L4 campaign itself promised. When Kirito thought about it, both promises sounded equally impossible considering to get out they were supposed to clear all hundred floors, but he didn't dwell on it too much. During the disastrous loss of the items, Kizmel had lost her high tier sword and now had to return to the castle to explain the situation. She had effectively betrayed the Dark Elven cause to help save players she did not even know upon Kirto's request. With heartbreak in their hearts after the events, Kirto and Asuna separated from Kizmel and returned to the Curse of Station quest and tackling the floor boss instead. They had discovered that Maya's mother, Theano, was now rushing through the boss labyrinth to tackle the floor boss alone, potentially to vanish in a quest that has long gone complete haywire, that even Kirito did not know why the NPC was rushing into the boss room. The duo managed to catch her with the help of Argo and Maya, and shortly after, Kibao and Lind made it to the entrance of the boss room with the ALS and DKB, marking the beginning of the floor boss fight, the Irrational Cube, unlike its beta predecessor, the Irritating Cube. Back in the beta, the Irritating Cube was a giant Rubik's Cube that featured the traditional colored sides. It was invulnerable, but once you rotated it to the same color sides by hitting the edges, it would become vulnerable for DPS. However, the Irrational Cube had no color coding, only numbers. In panic, not knowing what to do at all, they wanted to run away, but the boss room was sealed shut. On theme with the rest of the floor, there was a hard mode Sudoku puzzle to unlock it. 729 of them. But as if it was intended, the NPCs with them, Theano and Maya, stepped up to solve the puzzles. They could solve each in about 10 seconds as they were basically using the computational power of the game and about an hour of playing the dodging game against the invulnerable boss, the players were free, or so they thought. Instead, the 729 puzzles flashed and turned into a 27x27 27 27 grid, 9 new Sudoku puzzles. 
they had just managed to reach the next phase of the boss fight without even realizing. With those puzzles solved, it gave 9 new numbers in a 3x3 grid. The ticket to their DPS phase was to arrange the 9 numbers in the same placement on the face of the boss that was lit up. Despite causing a lot of issues at first, the teamwork between the clearers allowed them to reach the DPS phase and easily whittle down the boss's health to a single pixel, at which point the boss just stopped. As everyone was carefully watching the cube, fearing a self-destruct, a player from the DKB jumped up, rushed to the cube and took its central golden cube, the key object of the Curse of Station questline that Theano had brought here and activated it to paralyze all the players in the room. A player named Buxum, who unlike Joey and Morte, possessed the intelligence to not be an obnoxious standout and never drew much attention to himself up until now. When all seemed lost, Kito's meditation skill activated with the Awakening mod in a moment of distress, allowing him to break out of the binding debuff and repel Buxum. As he ran away, Kito put the cube back in the boss and hit it with the pommel of his sword. Around 11pm of January 4th, the Irrational Cube was defeated and Floor 6 of Aincrad cleared. It was only the next day, January 5th, that Kirto and Asuna stepped onto the crimson blaze of eternal summer. Arriving at the town of Lectio, the players on Floor 7 had two separate paths to choose from. Northern mountain region with tougher enemies or southern beach resort region with easier enemies. What made the choice hard was Kirito's experience with the resort. Or rather, the casino inside that caused him to lose all of his savings back in the beta. However, the beach was enough to convince Asuna, despite the threat of the casino. There was an L4 quest on this floor as well, which was found in the very middle of the map. As the path taken did not affect it all that much, Kirito and Asuna decided to help Argo with a mysterious quest in the casino, a feud between the two houses in charge of the establishment, the Nachtoi and Korloi families. Siding with Nirnir of the Nachtoi house, they investigated a potential trickery being used in the monster arena, where both families fight tamed monsters for the crowd to bid on, with the largest prize being the Sword of Volupta, with exquisite power being promised. And sadly, their discovery had not come quick enough to save both the Aincrad Liberation Squad and the Dragon Knights Brigade from losing a massive amount of their savings and previous winnings. However, to prove the nature of the foul play and take measures against it, it was more to be done and it somewhat coincided with the L4 campaign of this floor. Heading into the middle of the map for the Elven hideout of the floor, Kirto and Asuna were not exactly sure what to expect, they technically had stolen the keys and lost it to the fallen elves. They didn't expect the dark elves to treat them kindly, but they sure did not expect getting imprisoned. Managing to escape from captivity thanks to the help of another dark elven prisoner and run away from the hideout by breaking out Kismet along the way and continue on the casino questline instead now that the elf war has taken a massive and uncertain turn. Kirito however botched up big time right before a large operation by sneaking into the Korloi family barn in secret and allowing the trick monster to escape, so when he came back into the room with Nirnir of the Nachtoi family for official inspection, there was no trace of it left. The good news is that during their time they discovered a very suspicious room used for the trick, but the bad news is they were so tunnel visioned into the suspicious room that they never saw the trap of the Korloi family. Lady Nirnir was bitten by a silver poison snake and her life was now limited. When they arrived back at Lady Nirnir's room, they were informed that she was a lady of the night, a vampire. And with silver poison in her blood, her time was now running out. The only ailment would be dragon's blood. The legendary hero of Volupta, Falhari, had defeated one of the two dragons with the famous sword of Volupta. The other resided on the top of the Labyrinth Tower as the floor boss of floor 7. And thus, a race against time started to defeat the Fire Dragon, whose name I will not even try to attempt pronouncing. In a desperate attempt to get both guilds rolling quickly, Kirto brashly offered that whoever would help more in vague terms would get the guild flag he held in his possession since the defeat of Fuscus the Vacant Colossus on floor 5 or the Sword of Volupta that he had won earlier by betting against the two guilds in the cheat round. He avoided being specific as to what it meant to help more because he feared it would get in the way of the guilds 
actually cooperating to defeat the boss, turning the battle into a DPS check mess. The battle against the dragon was harder than expected, and to extend the life of Nirnir, Kirito had to allow the vampire to suck his own life, which granted him a mysterious status effect. He lost sense of warmth and his vision sharpened. He grabbed the sword of Volupta, which now shone red, and granted him multiple buffs now that he had the vampire status effect. With one last attack, Kirito slashed down and then sideways, producing a cross-shaped projectile that hit the dragon and turned it into polygons. Floor 7 had ended with a lot of mysteries. Lady Nirnir was saved, but as the crew had a chance to breathe a little at the beach resort after the boss fight, it was all the more of an enigma as to what the future floors had in place for them. Apparently, the fallen elves were also partly responsible for the cheating in the casino, working with the Korloi family against Lady Nirnir with eternal life. Kismel was now a fugitive alongside Kirto and Asuna in the eyes of the Dark Elves. In just two floors, the quest would reach its climactic conclusion, and the PK gang working with the Fallen would only ramp up during that time, led by the man in the poncho. Kirto was now classified as a vampire in the game, thus could not comfortably step in light, and nobody was sure how long the effect would last. And all the more surprisingly, after the boss fight, both Lind and Kibao had come to talk with them, refusing Kirito to make a decision until the next boss fight as an apology for making a mess throughout Floor 7 in general. Floor 10, a milestone floor that featured harder monsters than usual, awaited the players just above, with Kagachi the Samurai Lord protecting the passage beyond into a world no beta tester had ever reached before. A lot more stories awaited our heroes on future floors of the floating castle of Aincrad, but this is as far as the Sword Online Progressive series goes for the time being, and as such, we are going to be jumping forward in time from January 8, 2023, as well as featuring a lot of more bite-sized information in the process.